So let's do the courteous rearrangement. So the courteous rearrangement allows you to take a carboxylic acid and convert it by decarboxylation into the into the corresponding amine. So as you go from that to or NH2 or a few other variations. How does it manage that? Well, the first step, if we treat that with something like thionyl chloride, so Cl2, we can be happy that we can make an acid chloride. And then if we treat our acid chloride with sodium azide, so azide N3, azide is a really good nucleophile. It's perfectly linear, so it's not sterically hindered in any way, and it's got a net negative charge. This can attack and displace the chloride in a classic tetrahedral intermediate collapse, reform your carbon oxygen double bond. And at the end, what we end up with is an acyl azide. And nitrogen in the center has a positive charge. And in this resonance form, the nitrogen at the far end has a negative charge. Well, as you may have seen, if you've seen azides before, they can resonate. And that makes sense because we can push that pair of electrons in here and that pair of electrons onto that nitrogen and the negative charge just passes back and forth between the two nitrogens. Let's look at the other resonance form. And we'll start to notice something quite important about it. So if we look at that resonance form, you can see that we have a nitrogen-nitrogen single bond and a nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond. And this single bond, if it's broken and those two electrons are given both of that nitrogen, well, it will have produced nitrogen gas. And that's going to be entropically and enthalpically very favorable. So let's do that. You can do that if you heat this reaction up, put in a bit of heat, and we'll see what happens. So if we break that bond and give the two electrons both the nitrogen, well, let's follow the rules. So let's draw out exactly what's up there, except down here, except for the one thing that has our arrow going from it. So here we have our nitrogen, no arrow going from the negative charge. It's this bond that's disappeared. If you want to, you can draw in the additional lone pair. So this is one lone pair. This is two lone pairs. This lone pair is still here. And we also have our nitrogen, nitrogen triple bond. And that lone pair is still there. And just to highlight this, what we've done is we've taken those two electrons and we've given them to this nitrogen. So that's nitrogen gas. It's gonna leave, it's just gonna bubble out of the reaction. But this orbital here, which was on the nitrogen, is now empty. So formally, if we are following our rules, we've produced a nitrogen that has both a positive and a negative charge. It's in fact neutral. It's what's known as a nitrene. So a nitrene is analogous to a carbene, which you meet in the Wolf rearrangement and also in a, a few other uh, reactions. What's it gonna do? Well, here it is, a row two uh, element over to the right, group number five, row two, has only six electrons in its outer shell. It really wants to get eight electrons in its outer shell. So it's gonna to have to come up with some rearrangement by which it can make this happen. And what will happen is that this bond, this carbon-carbon bond to the ore group will shift across and make a new carbon-nitrogen bond. And this pair of electrons can account for the loss of this bond from that carbon. What do we get? Well, if you follow that through, if you rearrange it, uh, or if you draw it out exactly as it is, without moving anything around except the bonds that have moved, you'll see that your bond angles are very ugly, but you'll also see that you have the right bonds in the right places. So let's do that, even though it's gonna result in an unpleasant looking picture. So we moved this pair of electrons here, and we moved this pair of electrons here. And now nitrogen, and I know the bond angles are terrible, nitrogen has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. It's got four bonds or three bonds in a lone pair. This carbon still has uh, four bonds to it. So everyone's happy. So that rearrangement happens very quickly. And that's called the courteous rearrangement. But this product that we've made is an isocyanate. And isocyanates are quite reactive. So you have a carbon in the middle, double bonded to an oxygen, that's gonna make it a bit electrophilic, but it's also double bonded to another nitrogen at the same time. So it's gonna be very electrophilic. So any kind of nucleophile at all in this reaction and something is gonna happen. But before we continue, I'm gonna redraw this out with some better looking bond angles. So that is equal to, there's no changes here, but if 
we draw it out with better bond angles, or nitrogen, linear sp2 bonds, and carbon dual bond oxygen. So this is actually sp hybridized this carbon in the middle. It's perfectly linear on both sides. This nitrogen sp2 hybridization, this oxygen sp2 hybridization. So we've got quite a reactive intermediate here. What happens next? Well, let's redraw it out and we'll look how it might react with the range of different nucleophiles. You can do this step in all sorts of uh, solvents. You can do it in alcohols. You can do it with amines or ammonia present. Um, or you can do it with water. So let's look how it might react. Okay, so I've redrawn the isocyanate out of here. I've drawn it out. We're going to look at two cases first and we'll move on from there. But the first possibility is that you do re the reaction and you use water as your solvent. And water is an alright nucleophile. It's not too bad. And this is a good electrophile. So what's going to happen? Well, like any carbon oil, this is going to attack the carbon, carbon with the carbon oxygen double bond. And the bond to break first is going to be the carbon oxygen one because it's more polarized. The oxygen is going to be happier with the negative charge. It's more electro negative than the nitrogen. You can rationalize it any of those sorts of terms. So move that up there. Tetrahedral, well, it's not a tetrahedral intermediate, but it's still an intermediate because ultimately you'll reform the carbon oxygen double bond. So in the second part of this, you'll reform the carbon oxygen double bond. You'll have a proton transfer and you'll end up with a carbamic acid. So do that. That's going to move back down. That's going to move across. And you're also going to have proton transfer all in the one. So I'm going to put in lots of steps because you can't really draw them all in one mechanistic step, but we're not going to look at them because you should be familiar with them. So or N H carbon double bond oxygen OH. Now, this looks like a carboxylic acid, maybe like any other, but because there's a nitrogen next to it, it has some interesting properties. And one of those properties is that it is only stable if it's in a very high pressure atmosphere of carbon dioxide. So they're not typically stable under normal conditions, but they are in their transient sense called carbamic acids. And if this is acidic and this is basic, well then they can interconvert between that form and the negative charge on the oxygen and two protons on the nitrogen. And as you can imagine, if you have a situation where this bond is now much, very significantly weakened and you can form a carbon oxygen double bond and give those electrons back to the nitrogen with the release of carbon dioxide gas, you will. And so ultimately what you'll end up with, carbamic acids decompose to give you or NH2. And so we did as promised, we converted our carboxylic acid that we started off with to an amine. But there's other possibilities. So what about this situation here? In this case, we use water, we got an acid, and it was possible for proton transfer to allow it to decompose to give you your amine, and let's not leave it out, carbon dioxide. But on the other hand, if we use something that has an ester there, what are we gonna make? Well, we're gonna make something that's more stable. So same thing, uh, that'll attack there. Electrons go up, electrons come back, electrons end up on the nitrogen, and this proton moves down there all at the same time. So all of those steps happen without worrying particularly too much about them. What does our product look like? Uh, that's an or group. So that's what it looks like otherwise known as a carbon eight. Yep, that's a stable molecule. It will exist um, happily. And so that's gonna be our end point. And instead of having an amine, we have a carbamate. And carbamates have their own uses in synthesis. Things like protecting groups like Bach are carbamates. So they might be a target in and of themselves. That's not the only thing that you can do. You can put in a range of other nucleophiles. So if this is an amine, then we'd have a nitrogen here, in which case we'd have a urea. So if we replace this with NH2 and it has an OR and we have an isocyanate, then this would attack the carbon 
move the electrons up, move the electrons back down again, proton transfer, and eventually what you'd end up with would be, and I'll make that R1, this functional group here. And that functional group is known as a urea. Previous rearrangement is really useful, if only for turning carboxylic acids into amines, but also because it gives you access to this reactive functional group, which has lots of potential outcomes. Okay, I hope that helps. If you have any questions, post them below or ask me in class or post them up on Moodle. All right, that's all for now. Bye.